<laughs> Hi, everyone. I can see you there. I can see the halo looking at us. Glad you're all here tonight. We have a rather smaller attendance because everyone decided to go somewhere else. Well, no, not everyone. <laughs> but the folks that are here have already been handed out their complimentary $100 bills. <laughs> and uh, they're very happy. And they're also getting great cookies. They get lots of cookies and they have plenty of wine. So beyond that, we have a, an old friend of mine from many moons ago from UNL and other places. Uh, a person who likes cowboy boots and horses almost as much as she do, got, yeah, probably as much as she likes a guy named Brent Spencer. So. Yeah. Yeah, almost. He's, he's sometimes second. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes second. Okay, well, I'll let you just take off. All right, thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here, and I've heard about this writing center for a long time, and, and I just, I'm thrilled to be here and to finally see it. My husband, Brent Spencer, came down and he said, you're going to love that place. Everyone is so nice, and it's just a generous space. It's really good. So I said, good, good. So um, I'm going to read you the beginning, not the beginning, well, yeah, it's chapter 15, that's hardly the beginning, but um, a part of a new novel I'm writing. It's set in the Ozarks of Missouri. Um, it's based on some family history. It takes place um, during the Civil War and during uh, 1931 when they flooded um, a large section of that part of the country for the Lake of the Ozarks. And there was a, a town there um, that was that in a county that had driven my family out, of, out after the war because they were called uh, Black Republicans. They supported the Union. And so I always wondered, because they, um, my grandfather, one of my grandfathers then got a job moving the grave sites, the graves, and, you know, because they had to empty all the graves in that area. And I often wondered what they did with my ancestors. I suspect they're underwater. <laughs> I don't think anyone cared about them. So that kind of haunted me most of my growing up years, and I thought, okay, I have to write about this somehow. So this is uh, part of this, this book is called The Women of Lime Creek, and this is, uh, introduces a, a young woman named Tennessee, or Tenny Wayne, and her mom, her mother, her mama, as she says. Mama said it didn't mean nothing I should concern myself with when Ma Douglas drew a circle in the dust out on the road by our gate, then across in the middle and her, with her pointing finger, leaned over and spit right in the center. So even after she walked up the hill without looking back and I waited till her long strides carried her up and over and out of sight before I ventured out to take a look at that glob of silver white spit still sitting like a moon glistening right in the middle of the red dust fine as flour and I knew better than to cross her tracks. Knew that it was going to take more than what I knew to take the cuss off. And that was the way the war began for us. Conjured by the one person no one could break a conjure from. But I didn't know that yet, and my mama knew too much and didn't believe the hill folk who did things like cross their broom and mop at the doorway of their clean house to keep out the witches, or put the axe under the bed when she was birthing a babe. She and Papa moved here from St. Louis where they read books and listened to lectures by prominent thinkers before they lost their money, and Papa was brought out to the Ozarks here to run the railroad branch and live on the farm his great aunt died and left him. Ma Douglas was cussing us because Mom refused to gift her a chicken this morning, and I couldn't say why, she asked, or why Mama's eyes took on that peculiar hard light behind the gray that was normally so soft. Don't you give her anything, Tenny. I mean it. She wrapped the kitchen table with the thimble end of her forefinger, and I nodded as I watched the old woman open the yard fence, glance around, and come up the limestone path. Afterwards, I had to hide the poppet doll that looked like my brother. Mama didn't say not to take anything she offered. That came later. Mama was lying to me in those days. Hadn't told me yet that she'd grow up in these hills and came from a long line of women who could do things. Am I one of them? I asked, but she never answered. People generally don't in their coffins. Not usually. I watched a fly circle and walk flunkantly up her, her arm, half expecting her to shoo it away. I didn't smell her yet, not with the wildflowers and herbs we lined her coffin with. She'd be on the ground in a little bit. The neighbors were boiling sassafras for tea. The red buds' purple blooms and pink knots still stitched along the thin branches someone had stuck in a china vase from Papa's family, dealt blue. I kept waiting for her to startle awake, but the silver dollars lay heavily across her eyes, holding her in place. 
how cheaply we are sold into eternity, I realized, just as a rough gloved hand appeared and plucked the two coins away. Of course, it was Shad, my cousin, the kind of person who would steal the corpse money. This money belongs to my family. He leaned down and whispered in my ear. I watched as he sprinkled a line of salt, the length of her body as straight as a surveyor's chalk line. There, that will hold her, he said, and when I looked up, he was smiling. A man never to be trusted with his yellow-white hair and red beard shaped along his jaw like a faded star. His small ears clung so close to his head, people said he was stingy. The dollars jingled in his pocket, more proof. His whole face sat low, the features too close together, small, tense brown eyes like dried Job's tears, strung on a string. His brow so white and thin as to be invisible, a nose pushed into his face like a cowardly dog and a thin-lipped grimace for a mouth. Above it sat a domed forehead, permanently red and with ruptured as if too long in the sun, even though he wore a hat, even in the house, to make himself taller, more senior to the rest of us. I knew I was right, he declared, and the neighbors shifted uneasily and dropped their eyes. They'd known my mother as a healer and helper, not the witch my cousin believed. I was the only one who saw it. The neighbors began to back into the kitchen and out the back door to the porch. I could hear the men outside, passing the jug and muttering, a mule braid and the dogs groaned to be set loose from the barn. Shad's horse stamped against flies, sending the bits jangling. Is the hole dug deep, he asked. Let's go. I stood and went to lay a hand on his arm, but he jerked away and stared at me, fear in his eyes. You're, she's a Christian girl, young man. You keep your filth to yourself. Our neighbor, Abby Young, stepped to my side and laid a small cross on my mother's neck. See, you did wrong here, Shad. Well, Matt, this woman was called by the Lord. I noticed she didn't rush, she didn't brush away the line of salt. We'll get her ready now, Timmy, Abby Young said. You wait outside on the porch till we have her wrapped. I wasn't supposed to touch my mother again. They had told me with the patience of women for the stupid or young. It was the custom of the hills. I couldn't sit in a rock or on the porch either, and I couldn't speak, though Shad was swimming, swanning among the neighbors and townfolk bragging about his role in my mother's death. As a Gomer doctor, he'd broken a curse and killed her. No one spoke to him. Not a one. If it wasn't for the burial and after, I'd have taken my rifle and put a hole in him. That would have been, that would have, that would have to wait though. Shad was running for sheriff and thought he'd get hill votes by rooting out conjurers. He rattled the corpse money in his pocket as he bragged and the other men edged away. Times were tough enough without trouble like this, I could have told him. Look at the scars and missing limbs from the war. Look at the thin faces wearing hunger like a wasting disease on a cow, taking hair, teeth, and color. The small offerings of food cost too much of their larders. The corn stunted from drought. The wild game scarce since the war started. The few hogs unfatted, cows dry, chickens listless and plucked raw on their necks. Even the dogs, mange and lame, found almost nothing to eat. Shed's teeth gleamed white and his plump cheeks shone with the food he could afford. No one knew for sure which side he was on. Probably both, my mother had declared. He has the soul of a traitor. Once Papa left for the war, Shad began to make noises about the farm and how women, not even blood relations, shouldn't be in the possession, couldn't run it. So far, he hadn't convinced anyone to listen. Now that Mama was dead, I supposed he would make a louder case. She's ready, Abby called softly out the door, and four men came up the steps into the house and fetched the coffin. When Shad tried to follow, Abby's husband, Lemuel, stepped in his way and held up a hand. Mama had helped birth his four children and brought his wife back to health when she struggled after the last one. Shad opened his mouth to protest, and one of the older man, men who wore a pistol at his waist put a hand on his gun and stepped up next to Lemuel. Shad shrugged and walked away, stopping beside his sorrel horse, the sorrel horse tied to the fence. Another neighbor, Gus Sumner, sidled over to Shad and had a word with him, nodding in the direction of the men on the steps, their arms crossed, eyes down under the worn felt hats. Shad paused, stared down the road, gave a curt nod, mounted, and trotted away without a backward glance. Honest man, doesn't ride a sorrel horse, someone muttered. They put her in the ground, said words, came back to the house, shared a quiet, sparse meal, and left. I didn't realize it was night until it grew so dark I could hardly see my hand in front of my face. I thought about not lighting the candles on the old table next to the chair in the parlor, but then I fumbled with the strike box, lit a candle stub for the least amount of light. It produced a pale glow as small as the last embers of a fire instead of the warm, flickering circle. I was grateful for every slackening that acknowledged my mother's passing.
My brother had not come home, had probably not heard unless she had told him. He was the last of four boys in our family. One died young of lung ailment, then the next died on the train tracks. He was half deaf and didn't hear the train. Next, the oldest went to war and died the second day, caught in crossfire trying to steal horses. And that left the last, an oldest brother who never gave a damn about anyone. He wouldn't stop what he was doing to put his mother in the grave. I knew this. I knew what I would do when he finally came home to me. That long night, it seemed to grow darker and darker until the candlelight was the size of the tip of my thumb and silence hung over the house as if, if we were all buried deep in the ground. It was then that I asked her if I had the sight, if I could do things. But I was utterly alone, without thought or image. Once I heard a mouse squeak, its tiny nails clicking as it ran along the kitchen floor and ducked behind the wood box beside the stove. When I closed my eyes for only a moment, I thought I fell into a dream of my father. He was propped against a tree, his favorite book of poetry by John Donne lying tattered and bloodstained in his lap, the lower part of both legs shredded into bloody stumps. Brother didn't bother to take the book after he rifled Papa's pockets. He didn't close the eyes but left him staring out into a world that no longer belonged to, belonged to him as his last and only son, mounted a horse, clapped his legs against the gaunt sides, and trotted away. In my dream, the death beetles and crows made fast work of the body, which seemed to dissolve like powder thrown into water. My vision pulled back, and I could see that a great battle had taken place. Vast numbers of dead were being attended to by flocks of vultures and armies of insects. The noise was overpowering. Shrill chewing and gulping along nerves strung tight as fence wire and sprung with sharp, stabbing beaks. In the dream, the noise was far greater than the battle previous. There was no one left to admonish the dead or hush the peace that followed. When I looked back at my father, all that remained was the bloody book, pages sealed together and dissolving. My father's blue coat and gold braid sinking into the grass and dirt, dragged down and down until a time when wind would take down the tree, its roots rising naked and appalled into the sky. A scrap of blue cloth and a single button peeled by a root became a flag waving as pitiful memorial to the anonymous dead for thousand generations below, awaiting their turn. A crow dived down and grabbed the tarnished brass button in its beak and brought it to the tree trunk prone on the ground and began to tap, tap it against the wood as if under the mistaken notion that it, was, it would crack open and provide a delicious meal inside. My eyes jerked open and I heard the sound again, tap, tap, tap. I picked up the candle, wishing for a stronger light suddenly, but paused at the door, tap, put my ear to it to know what was outside, and was startled by the rapping again and again. I struggled against the tightness in my voice, barely releasing the two words, go away. Ma'am? The man's voice whispered, plea. I stumbled back, my foot tingling in the rag rug and almost dropping the candle. I set it on the floor and took up the loaded rifle we kept at the door when my father, when my brother wasn't here. I have a gun, I said, as I unlatched the door and yanked it open, my finger on the trigger. We were caught down the Osage River. Raiders, we were fetching supplies for our people. They took it all and left us dead. My pa had to leave him, got Cyrus away. He's out there on the mule we hidden when we camped after crossing. He paused and looked at me, his mouth open and a bloody face from a cut along the scalp line. You're not the woman we were told about. I shook my head and lowered the rifle, buried her today. He wiped the blood off his forehead and looked at his hand with hopelessness in his eyes. Don't suppose you, he peered more closely at me. Bring your brother in here, hurry. If there's readers about, none of us is safe. I didn't warn him about Shad, who was happy to earn money from any side by turning in his neighbors. I didn't have to leave the man's story, but Mama never turned away a person in trouble. Even my brother couldn't stop her helping folks he wanted to kill. I cleared the kitchen table and pulled the shutters and curtains closed to the light so the light wouldn't attract notice. We laid Cyrus on the kitchen table. He'd been shot in the gut. There was a long cut across his forehead, too, and half his scalp was torn off. Good God. I peeled back the bloody handkerchief on his stomach. Cyrus moaned and blood poured out the hole. His pulse was steady. He was dying. I doubted I could help, but to make him more comfortable. I lit the kerosene lamp, put water to boil in the kettle, and stoked the stove fire, keeping myself busy while I figured out what to tell the stranger. Ma'am, he touched my hand. My name's I hold up a hand. Don't tell me. It's safer if I don't know anything about you. Stay here tonight and we'll help him cross over. That's the best I can do. The man wiped his bloody face, opened his mouth to speak, nodded, and staggered to a chair to settle in for a the wind. 
When the water was hot, I gave him a wet rag to wipe the blood off himself and went to work cleaning and bandaging Cyrus's head and placed a thick cloth pad soaked with chimney soot and molasses over his stomach to stop the bleeding. I knew that powder from the puffball or ground golden seal would work better, but I couldn't remember which of the bags hanging from the low kitchen rafters held them. If there had been time, I would have gone to the barn for spider webs. Cyrus groaned and pulled, started to pull away the cloth on his stomach, but was stopped by his brother. Then I went to work on the on a tea of nightshade and honey to calm the pain and help him slip away. Mama had taught me this was the kindest medicine of all, the one that eased them into the boat to the crossing of the great dark river. My hands shook as I stirred the tea in the cup until the mixture turned dark and fragrant. I closed my eyes for a moment, unsure that I could go through with this. I was no yard doctor. I only knew as much as I could learn by watching my mother and her answering no one half the questions I asked. She kept hoping the war would end and she could send me north out of the hills forever. Behind me, Cyrus set up a series of agonizing cries that climbed the ladder of noise until surely anyone in a mile would hear him come looking. I nodded for the man to lift his brother's head as I put the cup to his lips and tipped it so that when he opened his mouth to cry out, the tea would slip down his throat. It was a miracle he didn't choke. The man kept up a litany of soothing songs and praises that came out of as a low murmuring that could have been the river on a windy night. When he reached to catch the bubble of tea on Cyrus's chin he, and was taking his fingers to his mouth, I shook my head. He hesitated and wiped his hand across the front of his dirty shirt with a new understanding in his eyes. We watched each other's faces as Cyrus began to quiet, his breathing slowed, until there were longer and longer spaces between the gasp and release, and finally, nothing at all. The man bent over the still form and put his cheek against his brother, whispering goodbye. When he straightened, his eyes were wet, but he didn't wipe them. That was two bodies on this table today. It was enough. Since it was still well before dawn, the man and I wrapped Cyrus in one of my mother's linen tablecloths cloths from our old life in St. Louis and went out behind the house into the woods next to a pile of limestone my father had meant to use for a fence. We dug the hole as deep as we could in the pitch black with the moonlight. And after we had Cyrus laid in it, we filled the hole with dirt and shifted a pile of limestone slabs to, top, to the top of the grave, stacking them as haphazardly as possible. By the time we finished, the eastern sky was a dull gray blue with a rim of yet soft yellow beneath it. Hurry, I said, over my shoulders I ran to the house. He strolled without hurry as if it were any ordinary day. I understood not wanting to leave his brother. But there was every chance that my cousin or brother or someone else would happen by now that word would be out that I was alone. Once inside, I cleaned up the blood, burned the rags as best I could, changed my blood-stained blouse and skirt, and combed my hair. I found the man sitting at the table, staring at his hands as if they belonged to another. I quickly laid out the food left over from the city's funeral and offered him a plate and fork. He gazed at the dishes and began to shake his head until I put my hand on his arm and said, You have to go soon eat now to keep your strength. When he finished, there was little left, despite the courtesy he kept extending by taking small portions and deferring to me. We both ate more than usual to fill the grief hole in our bodies. Leaning back in our chairs at the same time, we looked at each other and nodded. I got no money, he said, his hands open on the table. None needed. I didn't feel successful since the patient died. Mama would never have charged. It wasn't what we did. She had explained. People gave us food and such when they could and looked after us while our men were gone. That was the hill way. The man shook his head, eyes closed and lips pressed together. Then he dug a hand into his pants pocket, pulled out a ragged blue cloth, which he opened on the table to reveal a thin gold band engraved with flowers. Cyrus bought this for the girl he was going to marry. I inched back in my chair and pressed my palms against the edge of the table. He picked it up on the tip of his little finger eased it in a circle and held it out to me. I shook my head. I, I couldn't. I don't know. Outside, the birds that had started it in, a, in at dawn shut down and we could hear the soft plop plop of an approaching horse in the dirt out front. We jumped to our feet and I ushered him out the back door into the woods without a word. He glided away as if he were green smoke that rose in the damp dawn air. I shut the back door quietly and hurried to the front door where my cousin was waiting. Back in the kitchen, it was lucky I saw the blue cloth and ring before he did, and could snatch it up and tuck it in the pocket of my skirt, where it hid as if it were alive, snugging itself deeper and deeper until it felt a part of my body. This ring would betray me, I kept thinking. This was a curse. 
I wouldn't be able to conjure a wedding. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, you're the first. I haven't ever shown that to anyone. So. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Well, I hope it's okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a series of stories. Um, well, they're all related uh, from the perspective of these women who are involved in everything that goes on. And uh, those references to witchcraft and the conjuring and stuff. Um, my father had told me when he was at one point um, in the last year of his life that my mother could do things and that she had these powerful hands. Mm -hmm. And he hinted several times that she came from a family of people, women who could do things. And women often carry the power to heal, to you know, do these various things. All right, and this is a lighthearted one. This will cheer you up. I don't know if I want the spell to be broken, but go ahead. Yeah, okay. This is Mercur Mercurius. This is from the dog's point of view. Her collar. Sometimes at night it winks at me. Um, the light haunting. I watch it and imagine all the ways it can be killed. When she's in deep sleep, eyelids restless with dreams the way mine do. If she had a tail, it would be thumping. That's when I go to work on the thing around her ankle. I've tried chewing the hard plastic. The metal had my teeth keep but my teeth, teeth keep sliding off. The softer part of the collar material, like mine, but thicker, it gives in my mouth, but it's too tight to get a grip on, so I lick and lick to soften it like I do strips of raw hide she gives me, and maybe a shoe once in a while. When I manage to snag a tooth and tug, that light blinks furiously, and I know I'm in trouble. Her leg twitches like she's wearing the shock collar my old person used to make me wear. Don't get me started on that, though. I belly crawl off the side of the bed knowing that I'm exiled to the floor now. I always have to ask permission for her bed. It's a night of working on my posture then, getting my back aligned straight, my ribs and hips in perfect order on the hard, hard wood floor next to her slippers I love so much. I take the place I take the place her heel rests in in my mouth and chew the soft lamb's wool just a little for comfort as I fall asleep. I, I don't think she even notices. Half an hour a day. That's how long my walk is, or two times in fif at 15 minutes. Pee, poop, stretch the legs, smell every other dog, child, squirrel, rabbit, rat, big human bicycle, all in 15 minutes. <laughs> I go home and collapse afterwards, my ass sore from pushing so hard. Collar rubbed, color rubbed off my nose, it's lost its respectable black, now it's mottled red-brown like a Britain Spaniel. God, I do hate those guys. So nervous they pee, you even look at them twice. The heart's humming like the old refrigerator in her, part, her apartment. It needs the dust cleaned off the coils. I try to tell her every way I can think of, but good luck. She didn't even bother to argue for longer walks. Just look at my legs, the deep chest, the shoulders. But I'm made to run. I must have retrieved her blood, even though I'm a corgi. I beat the greyhound <laughs> at the dog park we used to go to. Not anymore. No, it's 15 minutes away, and she doesn't want the other two legs to know about her ankle collar. How the car rides stuff. It was all her fault. At first I misunderstood, thought she'd run down a pack of dogs, that I was ready to chew her arm off. No, I heard her explain to her mother. She might have been drinking from the bad bottle that made my stomach hurt and it came shooting out the other end when I lapped up the puddle she spilled <laughs> on the floor. Also, what I saw was her hand full of white pills for worms or what I get after I eat raccoon poop and my stomach is full of worms wanting me to eat more and more. She doesn't tell her mom about the worm pills. I was lucky she left me at home that night. She was crazy, talking and complaining under her breath like an old dog having to get up and move out of the doorway. And she was looking for a fight. I've seen her like that before. I went a while thinking she'd driven her car into a pack of beach dogs, like I said, and even though I didn't know them, they were my kind. And I stayed mad at her for a while. Eight holes in her soft wind, but I, I, like, she, I like so much it hurt me too. Then one day, her friend Tui came over bringing medicine that made them romp around like puppies, and I couldn't help myself. All that joy. I barked and play nipped and lapped up the pieces of popcorn when she poured the bowl over her friend Tui's head. No butter. She was trying to keep her legs and arms sapling thin, but I liked it. When she told the story of her night car ride on the beach again, it was three women, not dogs. She tried to run down. I loved her so much, I worked extra hard on the ankle collar that night, chipping a tooth, but the pain went away in a few days. We'd have to find another way. What a meal for the beach dogs, I dreamed. I shuddered at the pieces of fat and muscle and gristle and bone flying through the air, stuck on the car's front grill. They'd be sick for sure with all that fresh meat. Meal time. She says we both need to eat less, which is sad news to me as I, she fills my bowl with carrots and peas. 
I hate peas and always leave the little gray green knobs in the freshly lit bowl, beans and broccoli. I know the names because she holds them up and says it over and over until I bark, got it, in my language. <laughs> Instead of chicken or beef or lamb or my favorite salmon, she drops a mound of brown rice on top of the veggies. It's better than white rice, she says. We can live on the same food now. You can have my leftovers. I perk up at that idea, but then realize that only means more rice and vegetables, probably peas. I bet she doesn't like them either. But she's the happiest I've ever seen her since she got back from the bad place that made her clothes so ugly she threw them in the trash. I had to dig them out that night and drag them to the corner of the screen porch behind the sofa where I hide my special finds, like her clothes from prison, the hoose gal, she called it. I'd been in jail, caged when they caught me running free and living homeless. I had friends, but that's another story. She paid good money to spring me, she told her friends, to me, so now I owe her. It's quieter here, I'll give her that, except for nights she goes crazy and turns the music so loud I howl against my ear pain until she turns it down. She dances and jumps around, and I notice how the ankle with the collar isn't as graceful. It lags behind like she's got a thorn in her paw, or somebody stepped on it. I feel bad for her and jump around, too, to keep her from noticing her injury. I just don't want her to get sad again, and I have to do my business on the hall rug, but she won't get out of bed no matter how hard I bark and pull at the blanket she has over her head. She takes some warm pills those sad times, but not in cream cheese like I need when I eat the raccoon poop and have to see the rat. <laughs> Every time we go, I think to myself, okay, this is it. <coughs> the big goodbye, and I cry and snuggle and look deep in her eyes to show I'm sorry for whatever, whatever I've done, but that's never it. <laughs> and after each visit, we go and get ice cream. Oh. Not now, though. Now she barely has time to walk me around the block for a quick pee or two. I remind myself not to drink too much water, like I did when she went out for hours and hours and drove the car into the bushes and the mailbox at dawn. Yesterday, a man came to the door, and she gave him the keys, and he drove the car away. I was terribly sad, and already missing the smoked knuckle bone I'd tucked away in the back seat where I usually stood with my head out the window. I could still see where I licked the glass, waiting for her to come out of the grocery store where she bought me cans of beef, chicken, lamb, and my favorite salmon before we started eating the same food. What she does all day. At first she used pencils that made colors on the paper. I ate a blue one and turned my tongue that scary color that Sharpay at the dog park showed us one day. It was truly awful. Plus that droopy skin, we all ran away as fast <laughs> as we could, leaving the stick we'd been playing with so he could strut around like he invented trees or something afterwards. I always avoided him, a real monster. She frowned and didn't think it was funny or sad that my tongue was blue and I couldn't get outside to eat grass and clean things up. When I lapped from the toilet, the water turned blue and I thought, oh no, she's going to know I've been lapping from the toilet again. <laughs> but she didn't say anything. She was too busy putting colors on the paper. I tried to see what she was making, but it wasn't clear until she switched to paint. Her mom bought her in a, brought her in a, big bag, in a big bag of tubes and brushes and those squares of white. They hugged and laughed and her mom scratched my head, something she's never done. Only nine more months, her mom said, and glanced at the income collar. I shivered. That sounded like forever. I sighed and went to the porch and laid down behind the sofa with my head on the pile of my things. I'd added a pair of her underpants last night, and the scent smelled good, though not as rich as when she was still eating meat. And I remembered the shore dogs and splattering bodies of the three women. They hadn't even been touched, as it turned out. Just frightened. She told Tui that the women said she didn't even try to break or slow down, and they had to jump out of the way. What did they expect, she said. They were on my beach at three in the morning. She laughed and shook her head. I have nothing to say here. If I see someone, my kind or another, on the sidewalk in front of our apartment, I tear the roof off trying to get to them. I have to respect that kind of watchful watchfulness. Anyway, putting color on a brush and plastering it on the white cloth makes her happy, so I am too. When she finally holds up a painting to show me, I smile and wag my tail really hard, thinking maybe she'll fetch me one of the jerky treats her mom left for me, but she doesn't. She starts another picture. It takes a few days for me to realize that what she's painting are lilies. She tells me this so I know. Single ones, whole fields, etched on walls, growing out of a dog's skull. Is that me? I go to lick the picture to see and she snatches it away. She begins to paint more dogs and lilies I have them growing out of my ears, my back, my forelegs, and my ass. Put the sharp hay in one, I try to tell her, using my deep looking eyes, but she doesn't get it. How about the Brittany or that yappy Karen Carrier with the crusty eyes lives upstairs? I keep sending her messages, but she's not receiving. 
She paints a picture of a dog at a bowl of lilies instead of food. I grow uneasy. She uses reds and yellows and blues, but her favorite is white. Soon there are pictures of onions and asparagus, both unfortunate adventures in Eden. I can hardly stand to walk past those pictures lining the hallway wall to dry. Time's going fast now, she says to me on our morning walk. Hurry up, and practically dribbling pee down my legs as she rushes me along. Smoke and fire. I smelled the smoke for days before her mom called to tell her about the wildfire. It kept me up most nights, watching the ceiling for the flickering light that would mean the fire was closing in on us. I paced to the living room and looked out the front of the building and tried to get the other animals to tell, the, tell me the news. They were still mad about the way I chased them and ate their poop though. I moaned loud enough for the Karen Terrier upstairs to answer and we made a truce and said we'd bark if we saw fire close. We went on even faster walks on the smoke day, but we didn't dare walk too fast because it made our lungs hurt and our eyes sting. I think she would have liked it if I refused to leave the house and lifted a leg in the hallway instead. I had to go out there though. I had to see and smell and hear. Was the sidewalk hotter to the touch? Was the fire coming from below us? When the wind blew ash into our faces, I knew it wouldn't be long. The ash was from the stand of pine trees by the dog park, and I hated the idea of those trees burning now, down. It would be too hot there, and we'd have to, no sticks to drag around. I wondered what the sharp hay was up to with his blue tongue. Maybe it wasn't such a bad thing, the blue tongue. We were back inside gulping water in ten minutes. She wet a washcloth and put it over her face and stood there breathing the moist air in and out like a panting dog. Then she wet it again and put it over my eyes and nose, and I liked how the air smelled like water instead of fire. She gave me a jerky treat and smiled at me, and I knew we were in this together. Should we evacuate, she asked me. I didn't know the word. I felt panic rise from my toes, up my belly, and along my ribs. I shook my head, letting my ears clap loudly enough to drown out my fear. I don't think so either, she said with a curious little smile. She gave me a second jerky, though I hadn't finished the first one, went to the dining room where she'd set up her easel and paints. On the stand was an empty canvas. She squeezed a tube of white and another of yellow and picked up her brush. A lily appeared floating in the air. She squeezed a dab of red next to the yellow and then black and brown. I'd never seen her use these colors together. I'm a black and brown and white corgi, and when she painted me, the colors were always exact. Now the lily was coming out of brown and black earth, the fire burned around it in red and yellow. The center of the lily held a face, and it was a woman person like her. The lily grew in the fire raged, and I worried that it wasn't only in the painting. I thought I could smell thicker smoke, and there was a crackling like wood burning, and I listened for the upstairs dog to warn me, and I whirled away to check the windows, and outside it was thick gray like she painted it, and I couldn't even see the sidewalk. I barked as loud as I could, listened for the can, but there was only silence. Then a long bleeding horn signaling over and over, we had to get out of there. I ran back to her, but she was on the floor cutting away the ankle collar with a big knife she used to slice a chicken in half. The collar blinked and began to wail, and when she was done, she laughed and stood, beckoned for me to follow. The cuts on her ankle where the knife slipped dripping blood onto the floor, leaving flower-shaped prints for me to follow, as if she were the god who made the fire, made me, made it all. <laughs> He's a good storyteller, isn't he? Yeah. I like him very